What's going on guys? Today we're going to go over winter patterns here at Lake the Ozarks for bass. This is kind of going to round out the seasonal pattern videos that I've been doing, so let's get started. Like my previous videos, I'm kind of going to go through the lake in sections, and I'll break it down. I'll zoom in on spots that I like or key areas, and I'll be talking about water temperature, the lake drawdown, water clarity, shad kill, structure I like to fish, so, you know, main lake, bluff ends, points, the backs of creeks, channel swings, brush piles around docks, all the things I like to target during the winter at Lake the Ozarks and the baits that I use to target those areas to help you try and catch more fish. So we'll kind of zoom in here and the first two things I want to talk about are water temperature and water clarity. So we'll start with the water temperature and say that winter fishing, I kind of put it around the 50 degree mark. Now it does kind of overlap a little bit with the late fall patterns. The fish are quite a bit spread out in fall, but as it gets closer to winter, water temperature starts to really decrease. The fish will start to group up a lot more. Now, when you get the water temperature down into like the 40s, mid 40s, uh, they really, really get grouped up and you're really solidified in that winter pattern. But I kind of start to think about it more when the water temperature gets a little bit closer to that 50 degree mark. As far as the water clarity goes, I'm looking for clean to semi-stained water during the winter. I do not want to get into muddy, cold water that is not a conducive environment to catch bass. Not saying you can't catch them in that, but I find that I struggle a lot more if I'm trying to deal with that. So if I have an option to find some clean or semi-stained water, that's where I'm going to head first thing in the winter. So what that means here at Lake the Ozarks is some of your cleanest water is going to be on the lower end here by the dam, up in the Gravoy, or down in the Niangua, as long as we don't get too much rain. If we get a bunch of rain, some of these uh, creeks can get washed out. And there's even been times when you get a lot of rain in the fall and they start drawing the lake down uh, and the whole lake kind of gets muddied up a little bit. But ultimately, this section here is usually going to be the most stable and cleanest water. And then the creeks, it kind of depends on the rain. If we don't have a lot of rain and these start flowing pretty good, they'll stay clean. And if you do get a lot of rain, they'll muddy up at first. And then you start going to the backs and they'll start flowing some clean water. And it kind of pushes that muddy water back out. So those are kind of things just to think about uh, if you are coming down this might be a good section to focus on or in the Gravoy or down in the Niangua. And of course, other sections of the lake, mid lake or in the glaze can have good water color. During the winter, you just gotta kinda keep an eye on the weather. And the river is gonna be generally quite a bit muddier, especially kind of the further up you get, but it's gonna fish quite a bit different just because it's a lot shallower. And it's honestly can be a whole different world up in the river than anywhere else on the lake. So the next thing I go over is shad. And there's basically gonna be two main groups of shad. There's gonna be those that are out on the main lake They've been out in the main lake. They never made any sort of migration or transition back to the creeks. And they're just hanging out. They're doing what they're doing. They have everything they need. We'll use this area here kind of as an example. So say you're out here uh, winter fishing and you start grafting around here and you're probably going to end up finding some schools of bait, big schools of bait. And you can start to pay attention to the depth that they're suspending at. And basically... If they're suspending, say, at 30 feet, they may be kind of on this break line coming off this steep edge. They may be over top of this long tapering point, kind of has a flat up here. And sometimes they're just suspended kind of out in the river channel, maybe off this little uh, main lake point kind of bluffy area. So the reason those shad are still out there is they've never had a reason to move. They have ample food. They can suspend at different levels based on the light penetration. And then they're close to deep water so they can handle any sort of temperature swings there's no reason for them to leave. So you're still gonna have your main lake bite all the time and you're gonna have the shad, they're similar to the bass. They're not all gonna migrate back here because there's no reason to. So as far as the other group of shad, I kind of think of it as they've made the migration back here to the creeks. You go back in the fall and you'll see in these flat areas here, it'll be so thick with shad, you can almost walk across it. And you'll notice as it starts to get a little bit closer to winter, water temperature starts to cool off a little bit, you'll notice that there'll be less and less shad in these big shallow flats. Now if you get a nice warm day and it warms up the shallow water really quickly they might you know make a resurgence up in there and they'll be there but as soon as it gets cold at night or the cold front comes in they kind of disappear. If you go graph through here or you shine live scope around or something oftentimes you'll notice that they're either going to move out to the guts like say in this creek channel here just kind of suspend out in the middle of nowhere no man's land or they're going to go over to like a steeper bank. So this side's a little bit flatter than this side they might kind of hug up along this bank here, suspended under these docks, anywhere in here. So those are kind of your groups of shad. And now, you know, they're not just going to be in the backs of the creeks. They may move out here uh, to the middle and just suspend. They may move kind of closer to the secondary points. Like here's kind of an example, a little bit of a unique spot. Uh, your creek channel runs through 
and it runs up along this little like ridge and it's a little flat that comes out underneath these docks so you get about 20 feet of water little hump here comes up to 15 feet and then it's like a little drop off so this might be a good area to target uh, you know, the shad are going to suspend. Same thing over here. So that's something to kind of think about. You're always going to have your shad that are still out on the main lake, and then you're going to have those that are suspended in the creeks, secondary points, out in the guts. All right, so I'll kind of zoom in some areas here and talk about what I'm looking for. But before I go any further, one thing that I do have in common with all my spots, especially during the winter, is I'm looking for something that has access to deep water nearby. So for example, bluff ends or main lake point in the backs of creeks, which I would consider... The back of the creek the last kind of steep bank you know last 45 degree bank close to the flat and then docks you know they, they i all want them to have deep water nearby so we'll kind of zoom in on this bluff end here as a little bit of an example so this bluff end has a dock suspended off the corner so that's even better but the fish have easy access to all this deep water out here they can just come suspend they can sit on the bottom of the rocks here just kind of hang out they can suspend under the dock and feed and then they can also slide up in here like say the sun's been up all day it's been kind of beating on this bank a little bit and getting it warm. The fish can kind of slide up and feed or just hang out. And then if the cold front comes or, you know, goes to night and the water temperature starts to decrease in these little bit shallow areas, they can just slide back out in a deeper water. They don't have to move far and everything that they need is right there. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. You know, that's just a classic bluff end. This is another good one over here. Then you have some of the main lake points, which is still very similar. This even has a little dock on the inside uh, portion of it, but... Same thing, you have all this area, shad can suspend in here, the bass can suspend. Great areas to throw A-rigs, you can throw uh, crankbait, you know, when the water temperature is still around the 50 degree mark, I like to still throw the wiggle warts or rock crawlers, just kind of run them slow. Your jerk baits, you can throw a jig, you can even throw a shaky head. Same thing, this is just another little rounded main lake point. It's got a nice little flat spot, nice little drop off. One side's a little bit steeper out towards the main lake. This one's a little bit more gradual. With the main lake stuff, I'm always looking for wind. I'm preferring the wind kind of come in and, and hit directly on it. But um, say it's a really, really windy day. It's nasty. It's cold or something and you're out fishing. Say the wind's coming out of the west. We'll just use that spot here as an example. It's kind of coming out of the west. You know, sometimes I get behind these and, and protect it from the wind. You can kind of cast out into the wind and bring your baits back and that can be productive. So Always keep that in mind if it's a real nasty day, kind of hide behind some main lake bluff ends if you want to try and fish main lake uh, and still reap some of the benefits of that. So we'll move into this little creek here just as another example of what I'm looking for. And you'll notice here is a creek channel that used to go into the main riverbed. It kind of comes through and Navionics, it kind of peters out over here. It doesn't really show much, but that doesn't mean the creek channel ends. That's just kind of where their creek bed uh, mapping stop. That's where they decided to end it. But you can kind of see the contour lines if you follow it comes through and boom kind of swings up right here so this spot right here catches my eye nice little channel swing that runs up on it it's not you know stupid obvious might be something that some people overlook but you have a little underwater point that kind of comes out and then it comes up on these docks so within these docks i'll be looking for a brush i'll be looking for any sort of rock change uh, behind these docks i'd be live scoping them or side scanning them and see what i see and take my time across them. You can, same thing, throw jerk baits past them. You can throw A-rigs, uh, your jig. You find some brush, toss your jig in there. I like to let it go down. I find the brush, I'll tick into it, and I'll just let my jig sit there, especially during the winter. That's a big thing for me. I like to just let it sit there. You gotta be patient, and then sometimes you'll feel a pretty decent bite, and sometimes it'll just feel like a little mushy when you kind of go to pick it up. And then that's the fish. One other thing I was talking about earlier is kind of the last steep bank in a creek. So I'll use this as an example, uh, kind of what you're looking for on the map. Now, if you zoom out like this, it looks pretty good. You're like, ooh, that looks pretty steep compared to all this. Like, you know, that might have some, some good depth change to it. And you zoom in and it's kind of disappointing. It's not all that great. So I'll actually go over here. I think there's a little bit better one. This is a little bit better. So you look on this side, see how it's relatively flat. You do have some little creek beds in here. And that's kind of a giveaway when your creek bed's on the side. That's letting you know that that's definitely the steep side and this is kind of the flat side. But uh, pretend that creek bed wasn't there on the avionics and you didn't know, you can just look at the contours and see how this is really close together. This is a little bit more spread out. So you know this is the steep side. So I might be targeting this bank right here because it's the last little spot out of this flat. So if there were fish back here uh, in the flats, maybe they're hanging out here in these real shallow docks kind of during the fall. And now they're going to slowly move out maybe a little bit to a little bit deeper water that's got uh, 
more stability, less fluctuation in water temperature. So that'd be something I'd target. Same thing, you got your jigs, jerk baits. Uh, you could throw your A-rigs around it. Really pretty versatile. Any of the baits that you're throwing on the main lake, you can throw um, you know, around the docks. That's always nice. So same thing with the secondary point. That'd be something I'd check out. Take notes. You know, if you're fishing in here and you start catching them on these last 45 degree banks, you know, then go run over here and find the same bank. Or trying to replicate that. Move over a pocket, see what you can do. Uh, maybe they're not so far back. Maybe you're finding out more fish have kind of moved out into the last secondary point like this. This is always good. It's like a, I call it a splitter or like a fork where you got two pockets and this is kind of the last big secondary point. A lot of times you're going to have fish that uh, stack up here. We'll move over here and something else I want to kind of touch on. I've talked about this before and I want to reiterate it is finding rock transitions on Navionics and on Google Earth. Utilizing both of those together to help you find rock transitions so when you get to the lake you can have you know you can have 10 or 12 spots picked out before you even get there you can go look at and just make kind of a little milk run so you're not out there kind of wandering around without any direction you know exactly where you want to go i kind of picked this out earlier you can see you've got the creek channel that comes in follow it down you can see it kind of swings up on the bank right here and then it goes out into the middle of the channel and you can tell that too just by your contours it's close together kind of spread out so to me, this is a good indication just on Navionics. There's probably a rock change here. You're gonna have kind of a bluff rock here. And it's gonna be a little bit smaller rock or something on this little secondary point. So I'll pull up Google Earth. Here is the bank we were just looking at. I'll zoom in. You can kind of see, got some bigger chunk rock. You've got the dock here. Still got kind of the bigger chunk rock. Looks like ledge rock. And then right around this area, you start to get into a transition. There's actually maybe a boat fishing or idling past it, it looks like maybe, when this was taken. And remember, um, on Google Earth, if you click this up here, you gotta have the desktop version to do this, and you can move your little slider to a date. So this is uh, current date. You can click back and go to March 2012 is a good time at Lake the Ozarks when the lake was drawn down and they got a good uh, satellite imagery of it. <clears throat> so this would be something I'd focus on, this nice little rock bank. You can go rock crawl down this, you can throw your A-rigs on it, drag jigs around on it, throw your jerk baits, all the shebang, uh, single swim baits, whatever, you throw big glide baits on it. Just things that help you maximize your efficiency uh, out on the lake. And using Google Earth and Navax together can be a really, really cool time saver, but you can also just use Google Earth. You can kind of zoom in on the bank and go down and look for other rock changes or things that maybe catch your eye um, that you can't see on Navionics. So I just spend time going through here. You can even sometimes see creek beds that come through, maybe have a little funny turn or something to them. That doesn't really show up on Navionics. So that's always something I'm looking at, like back here you can see during the flats, kind of what all that looks like. We'll move up into the gravel and just pick an area. We'll just pick this uh, gigantic creek arm here, basically. So this is going to have a lot of different structure in here that you can fish. You can fish your main lake points. This is almost like a little bluff end again. You can see basically the creek bed that runs up. Pretty major creek bed. It's still 45 feet deep all the way through here. It swings over, so you got your main channel swings you can fish that have some docks on them. If you're looking for brush out in front of those or the rock changes on that. You have an old bridge, may or may not be silted in. Might be something you could uh, focus on, some secondary points. You got so much stuff in here. This would take you a, a whole weekend to try and fish all this if you really wanted to try everything in here. And as you notice, you get a little bit further back. Uh, the docks get more isolated, it gets a lot shallower. You're gonna have more of a creek bed. So these kind of shallower areas in here, this is still pretty shallow, but you, you get out closer to like Oh, like in here, you're probably gonna find some shad suspended, like where these creek beds intersect out here, or they got the big bends. That's where a lot of times you're gonna find the shad just kind of hanging out. So if you have live scope or something, that'd be good. You can sometimes uh, just throw a rigs or single swim baits, spinner baits, uh, or even jerk baits through that, around that, and, and sometimes catch some suspended fish just hanging out, out in those areas. And this here again too, it's kind of a channel swing that runs up, kind of runs away, channel bend there. So. This whole little bank right here, this little stretch might be something to target, especially right here, it's pretty steep. So that's kind of an example up in there. And remember, you're gonna have different water clarity. Um, if it hasn't been a rain for a while, this is gonna start to get pretty clear coming out of these creeks. If you do get rain though, this is gonna be muddy first, but eventually it is going to clear out. Okay, we'll move down. Let's just kind of go to the mid lake area. So down here, 
you're gonna have a lot of the same things you're gonna have plenty of bluff ends to choose from the main lake points you got some over here you got some classic bluff ends all the way around here same thing i'm gonna throw a rigs jerk baits on these rock crawlers um big spinner bait like colorado blade is always good to slow roll on the bottom um looking for brush piles main lake points like this do a lot of grafting looking for shad looking for wind all right we'll move down here to the glaze there's some excellent uh visual spots down here in the glaze to kind of reiterate what i've been talking about earlier which is like your last steep channel bank like this creek channel kind of runs up along this edge here i guarantee there's brush down here in the glaze there's brush everywhere that people sink and the conservation has put in uh, same thing you got these nice channel banks up here looking for brush piles looking for rock changes i'm throwing the jig the jerk bait a rig the staple and a lot of these creeks set up really really similar so like this anderson hollow area sets up really similar to this i have the same like kind of creek beds and stuff so if you do good over in anderson hollow then i would run over here and try and replicate the same thing same thing with this creek bed not quite the same on the channel swings a little bit steeper banks kind of on both sides but still worth a try through there um as you come over to like some of these pockets you have all these little secondary areas uh these can be good these little secondary points have some brush on them and have good rock changes and stuff so that's always good back in here you have kind of some commercial docks that suspend out over the main channel so these would be areas you could get behind and kind of fish they have close access to deep water and then you can also fish out here suspended fish like spotted bass uh, hang out underneath these docks on the edges and then you still have plenty of kind of little channel swings through here like this gets a little steep right there and kind of follows all the way back nice little channel bank so plenty of areas to choose from and the glaze there as well and we'll move down here towards the niangua so the niangua can get nice and clear during the winter at times uh, and be really excellent winter fishing. The biggest thing I want to focus on is good old Haha ha Tonka down here. They have a nice little spring in here that runs into the lake. That can be excellent during the winter, especially when it gets really, really cold. You have a nice constant water temperature coming out right here, and fish can just kind of hang out in the spring. It's almost like you're trout fishing in there, but for bass. So that's always uh, fun to go down there. It can be a little bit hairy when they draw the lake down. You run through some mud flats and stuff, but you can still make your way down there. Moving up through the Niangua here, obviously it's kind of like a little river down here. You don't have as many real long uh, pockets or creeks that run in here. Most of them are just little like kind of short pockets that run in. So you have a lot of what I would consider kind of main lake looking type stuff, but it's not quite as deep out here. So just little like points and uh, kind of little bluff ends where you get real steep sections. But you do have a few little creeks like over here nice and little creek bed that runs in kind of steeper over on this side a little juts over and steeper over here pretty flat and it kind of comes all the way to the back and same thing over here you got a nice little steep bank that kind of runs in uh, right along the edge and then you have a little uh, outcropping there your creek channel kind of runs through so in in here you know you're looking on the steep spots and you're looking on the creek bed for shad that are suspended uh, just kind of hanging out so zooming out of the Niangua, we'll kind of go over to Little Niangua for a second. I'm going to group this in as basically the same thing as the Big Niangua. Uh, very similar, curvy, got a lot of little main lake, um, you know, kind of bluff in type stuff. Over here, like this is a little island, kind of juts out, real steep. The uh, uh, creek channel runs right up against this, kind of little tapering point that runs out. That can be a good spot to fish during the winter time. So now we'll go over to the river just a little bit. Um, you know, obviously the river can fish totally different than the lower end of the lake. It's generally going to get a lot shallower and it's going to be a little bit muddier as it gets further up. Now, with that being said, you get up into the shallower portion of it. Uh, this is going to cool off quicker than this up here. This is much deeper water. It has more volume. You got to cool all that water off where all this not as deep. So it's going to just naturally cool off quicker. So usually the river is ahead in terms of uh, every season, basically. So in the spring, you know, it's warming up faster and it's like pre-spawn and stuff is on up here more than it is here. And then the same thing in the winter. This is cooling off faster than this is up here. So you're, you're always a little bit ahead up the river. We'll kind of zoom in. You got plenty of creeks and stuff up in the river. Uh, we'll just kind of pick this for a second. So a creek channel that kind of runs through here. Focus on that. Little secondary points in here. You got kind of your more main lake points. You got a sweet bluff end over here. Um, plenty of things to choose from and you've got all these pockets and creeks that are basically the same thing so kind of pick what you want to do if you're getting bites out on the main lake like say this for example you know stick with that if that's not working kind of work your way back into the creeks a little bit 
start fishing some channel banks, maybe start at the very back and work your way out or vice versa and pay attention to where you're getting bites and what you're getting bites on, whether it's docks, brush piles, or uh, just sweet spots on channel swings, transitions. And as you go way up the river, you're gonna basically be fishing uh, kind of you know main lake channel swing or just main river channel swings, I would call it just the river channel itself. Or you can go flip some shallower docks. Now remember uh, when I say access to deep water, that is uh, relative to where you're at. So the fish that are like kind of up here in the river that spend their time in the river all year, you know, their definition of deep compared to a fish over here, their definition of deep could be two totally different things. So you don't have to necessarily be fishing in deep water, just try and have access to deep water and that is relative to where you're at. So up here, you know, that might be 10 foot deep. So you'd be fishing five foot. And especially during the day, the sun gets uh, beaten on these docks and behind the docks. I'm looking for, you know, brush piles or isolated cover, you know, pieces of concrete or metal, you know, big, big busted up rock, anything that can hold any sort of heat, that'd be a good target to throw a jig at and uh, catch some big bass doing that. So the last two things I want to talk about before we get to the baits is uh, shad kill and the lake drawdown. We'll start with the lake drawdown. So basically Amarin is going to start to draw the lake down around January, beginning of January, and then get it to winter pool, which is around five to six feet below uh, summer pool. Around April, they start to bump it back up towards uh, summer pool, I usually try and get it full again before Memorial Day weekend. So when they draw the lake down, like I showed in the Google Earth image, like over here, you can see all this uh, bank is exposed. So if you come during, I'll just say like late January-ish, February, you're gonna see the lake pretty well drawn down usually. And uh, that's kind of what you're gonna be looking at. So you, you get to see all the rock exposed, which helps kind of uh, find some rock transitions and stuff easier on the water visually. So I know kind of the old saying is uh, when the water is going down, you know, the fish kind of move away from the bank. As the water's going up, they kind of move up into the bank. And generally, I, I think I agree with that, but there's also sometimes during the winter where it's like weird uh, as they're drawing the lake down, it's like the fish get really, really shallow up on the bank, especially in the afternoons. I don't know if they're like rooting around, uh, if, if the crawfish are kind of holed up and as the lake draws down and the crawfish move back into the water that the bass are eating on them or what. But there's times when the, the fish are very, very shallow. As the lake's kind of being drawn down, I'm usually experimenting a little bit and checking out uh, you know, if there are some fish really shallow or if they are suspended out a little bit further. And if they are really shallow, um, you know, I'm using either a rock crawler or a jerk bait or a jig and I'm kind of casting up there and working out just a little bit. And usually, you know, you'll kind of catch them just like a few feet off the bank or you catch them really, really close to the bank and then you kind of start to replicate that throughout the lake. So as far as the shad kill goes, when the water temperature gets around 40 degrees, you're gonna to start to notice that. You're gonna either see large areas of all dead shad or areas of shad that are like on the verge of death or just barely moving, kind of bobbing, flicking their tail a little bit and then they float for a while and then do that just over and over, kind of like a jerk bait. And that is basically due to the fish not having the fat reserves to make it through winter. As far as fishing goes around the shad kill, that can be a toss up. You're gonna have some people that are gonna say, oh, I'm always fishing around the shad kill and you're gonna have other people saying, I don't wanna be anywhere near the shad kill because the fish have all that shad to eat and I can't buy a bite. So I've had both ways where I've caught them around the shad kill and through the shad and I've had times where I cannot get a bite through it. So I honestly don't know what to tell you there. It's kind of, you know, take your pick, fish through it, see if, if you get any bites. If you don't, try and find an area without dead shad uh, that are just floating everywhere and see what you get into. So usually you're gonna find that in these uh, creek areas that are a little bit shallower water, even in the guts, uh, than you will out in the main lake. Or the other reason is you have some fish that kind of die throughout here and the wind, you know, they, it generally pushes them back into an area. So that's usually where you're gonna see that. So that kind of covers the general basis of winter fishing at Lake the Ozarks. Now I'll go over some of the baits I like to use during this time. Now we'll talk about the tackle I like to use to target these areas. Now my boat is at the lake right now with all my tackle in it. So I kind of had to use what I have laying around the house here and I don't actually have examples of everything. I'll start off with a jig. I always have a jig tied on year round. Uh, here's an example of just one of my full skirt ones. This is a half ounce brown classic color. Catch fish with it no matter where you go. Um, I usually use the full skirt until the water temperature gets around the 50 degree mark. So kind of early on transitioning in between fall and winter, I'll still be using the full skirt. But as it does get colder, I will transition over to uh, more of a finesse jig. This is just a little Omega 516. These are super handy. And then I also tie um, 
just like some smaller profile like this it just has a lot less strands in it it's just a brown and purple and then i'm usually like going to pair something really finessey like this or the uh, omega jig little baby j jig i'm going to pair one of these usually with a croco gator uh, ring crawl and i don't have any of those with me right now they're all in my boat but it's basically just a very small um, plastic has very little movement i like to use that when the water usually gets below 50 degrees but when the water is warmer than 50 degrees or right around that mark i'm still usually going to use like a, either a beaver tail and cut it so it has the two flappers or you can still use like a rage uh, chunk or uh, rage tail crawdad imitation type things. I'm gonna throw that usually around docks, around the brush piles and just kind of let them sit in there. You can also throw it on channel banks and brush piles in there, main lake points. Don't be afraid either to have a real thin skirt like this on a heavier jig. This is a 3A sounds, which works good around pitching docks and stuff. But uh, if you wanna go up to a half ounce or even a 5A sounds jig and have this little profile with the real thin skirts, that's still gonna work really, really well for you and you'll be able to feel a lot better in that you know 16 to 20 foot range next up is a jerk bait this is a mega bass vision 110 with a little broken bill that's why it's at the house but uh you know classic at like the ozarks or any ozark lake during the winter and through the fall you can really throw jerk baits year round you just gotta speed up the retrieve a little bit and kind of be creative it's more of a thing uh, up north especially in some of the smallmouth waters to throw jerk baits year round but you can throw them here uh year round if you want and have success but uh, really, really a staple in the winter time. Now, as far as colors go, this is Ozark Shad, so it's not really transparent. It's a very solid color. It actually has some decent reflection in it as well. But this is something I would more use on a cloudy day. On a sunnier day, I would use something that is a little bit more natural or transparent that you could see through a little bit better. Um, that is also if the water is clear. If the water is a little bit dirtier, then you might go with something that's a little bit more solid, a little bit more contrast. And then sometimes I like to throw in the colors like LG Bone that have um, chartreuse on it. So that's kind of like a mixture of transparent, but it's also got a little bit of like a purple bluish flash to it. And then the chartreuse belly, I think gets some bites sometimes. So basically just remember trick bait, you're imitating shad and underwater shad, the gizzard shad or thread fin, but like the Ozarks primarily gizzard shad is, um, they have like a little bit of a purple reflection or like hue to them in the water if you ever pay attention to them. Moving on from there, I'll talk about the A-Rig real quick. I don't have any A-Rigs with me either. Pick your favorite A-Rig and you're going for either a bladed or a bladeless A-Rig. I tend to have more luck with a bladed A-Rig here at like the Ozarks down at like Table Rock and stuff where water is a lot more clear. Uh, it seems like the bladeless A-Rig kind of comes into play a little bit more. But as far as the swim baits go, I'm usually throwing a Kitek um, 3.8. You can do a 3.3 or sometimes a 4.3 or even a 4.8, but I usually wait until the water's kind of warming up a little bit before I put the bigger ones on there. But uh, you can also do a few things to help get you some more bites. Uh, you can put a bigger swim bait in the middle. You can add a little bit of color to it. My main colors at Lake those arcs are gonna be Shad, which is, uh, I don't know how well you can see this in the light. It's like a purple, silver flake, and it's got a little bit of gray and silver in it. That's a great color. Bluegill Flash is a great color. Just uh, plain white is, is good. And maybe like a small mouth magic sometimes I throw up here, but usually it's Shad, Bluegill Flash, or white on the A-Rig. And uh, just kind of mix that up on your, your depths or your retrieve. Usually putting the A-Rig over top brush piles is good, whether you're back in the creeks or you're on channel banks or out on main lake points, that'll get you a lot of bites. Or uh, if you're just working at a bank, I try and keep it just above the bottom, almost hitting the rocks a little bit, but just above it so you're not getting stuck all the time. And uh, if there's ever like a lip coming off a channel bank or something, if you can slow roll it right over top of that, a lot of times they're gonna come up and get it. So that's always good. Um, another thing that's kind of in the same regard to that is your spinner baits and swim baits. So when the water temperature is not too cold, say around the 50-ish, maybe a little bit, you can still kind of get away with the willow leaf sometimes, you just gotta slow roll it. This is kind of just like a shad color. I started tying some spitter baits myself too, just experimenting. So this is one that I made. Um, and then as the water gets colder, I like to go to the Colorado blades. This is a uh, three quarter ounce actually. So this would be a good one to throw a little bit deeper. Uh, this has two Colorado blades. You can really slow roll. It puts a lot of vibration out, a lot of thumping. And if you really want to get crazy, you can actually get rid of your tandem blade and just put a extra large uh, Colorado here. 
and really put off a big thump with slow roll. And same thing kind of with the A-Rig. Uh, you could throw this over the brush piles. You can usually does the best for me around docks or on channel banks and stuff. And I'm, I'm throwing it out, letting it hit the bottom basically. And I'm reeling it back as slow as I can, kind of stair-stepping it down, letting it uh, tick off the bottom. That's usually when I'm getting the most fights. We'll go to just another swim bait tactic. You can throw a single swim bait. You can throw a regular jig head uh, with no blade, or you can throw a little bladed jig head like this. This can work good. Same places you pretty much work your A-rig or spinner bait around would work well. And then another little uh, good winter bait that is fun to throw is a little swamp bug here from Crocagator. These are these are great. They got these little legs on here, just a little action, and you got your little curly tail. Something you can just put on a little shaky head or a little uh, like a ball jig head and just cast it out and just work it back real slow. It'd be something good to put on a, a spinning reel and a pretty light tackle and just work it around those banks so you can catch some nice fish on those. Um, so those are like my staple baits, things that I'm pretty much gonna be using all the time. But if you wanna go and experiment, have a little bit of fun, uh, like a blade bait's fun or a jig and spoon, find some suspended fish, work them like that. A drop shot would work. You can throw rattle traps out and kind of work those like a blade bait where you toss them out, let them hit the bottom and kind of rip them up and let them flutter down. And of course you can still throw glide baits and stuff in the winter time and catch fish. And you're pretty much working those like a jerk bait, just real, real slow and just let them kind of sit. And you're gonna do your best there probably on the main lake or uh, deep channel banks over top brush piles. Just a little recap, remember one of the main things you're looking for is suspended bait fish. They're either gonna be out on the main lake or in the guts of the creeks or suspended on creek channel banks or around some sort of structure, humps, anything like that. Just because that's what they're primarily feeding on doesn't mean that's the only thing they're gonna eat. You can still catch fish around docks or you're feeding on bluegill and crawfish. Uh, you can go through these shallow areas and flip around or throw your A-rigs or jerk baits. You might be surprised what you can catch, especially if you get a nice sunny afternoon and it starts warming up the rocks or starts warming up some of like the junk around the docks, you know, your floats or your uh, anchors and supports and stuff. Don't be afraid to fish around that. You might be rewarded with a big old large mouth that's sitting up there just trying to get warm. So hopefully this video can help you get on some winter fish or maybe catch your personal best in the winter time. So thanks for watching guys.